been doing uh, fasting and prayer. I hope that most of you join us partially, completely, whatever you did it, uh, days or partials during the day or some meals. Uh, it's always beneficial to do it. So during this week of prayer and fasting, I've been uh, really searching scriptures on the topic of fasting, uh, going through long list of scriptures in the Old Testament and the context in which. But I was interested in uh, trying to understand the usefulness of fasting. Why, why were they fasting? Wh how, when did it start? And why would they do that? And more specifically, uh, to, to understand God's view of fasting. And I discovered that there is no command uh, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament to fast. There is no instruction there is no exhortation that you should uh, do it. And there is no theological teaching about fasting. So why is it important to fast when you look at that? Uh, actually, you will find fasting linked to stories of ordinary people in the Bible, uh, the people of God fasting. That's where you find the, 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 what we could see the theological point of view of that by looking at the lives of people, by looking at the events, by looking at the occasions in which people were fasting and humbling themselves uh, before the Lord. So when people would approach God with humility and c confess their sins and sorrow and come to God with urgent prayer. In the Old Testament, people would often fast during times of calamity. Um, in order to demonstrate their change of hearts and uh, their distress and everything. And um, we, we see that in the, in the coming slide here. Aha, better turn it on. Yes, thank you. Okay, and this text here. Uh, when tragic events would struck God's people, people would react immediately with fasting. When the Israelites, let's say, lost a battle to the Philistines, uh, this, it says here that when Saul and Jonathan died in this t terrible battle, they mourned and wept and fasted all day for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the Lord's army and the nation of Israel because they had died by the sword. In Esther chapter 4 verse 3 you will find something similar when the news of the edict of the king that the Jews would be put to death throughout the, the, the Babylonian kingdom uh, as the news of the king decree reached all the provinces there was great mourning among the Jews they fasted, wept and wailed uh, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. So we see them quickly in times of calamity they would come. In the midst of the upsetting uh, situations and the, uh, the, the, the gravity of the situations and the, uh, the urgency of the situation when tragic event would come, then they would turn to fasting and humbling themselves and going to God. The fasting helped them to express their distress, their helplessness, and their urgent hope of divine help. So that is one uh, aspect that you see a lot in the Old Testament. I'm only presenting these, these texts here, but there's a long, long list of that kind of uh, tragic events, calamity, uh, and Joel, you read that uh, they call a uh, fast when the locusts came and ate all the crops and they were, you know, in drought and things like this. So you will find a similar text like this. Um, and, and also fasting uh, helped them many times to in the time of prayer, even an in individual prayer, like in Psalm 35, uh, when David uh, prayed and he expressed it in this way, but I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. We have also many scriptures of that kind expressed in this way. When David um, uh, heard the words of Nathan and Bathsheba was pregnant, and God said, you, you, your son will die. He went into fasting and humbling and even laid all night on the, on the floor. He would not eat. He would not uh, get any comfort for himself. So Bible character often fasted while they were praying. And fasting is part of personal prayer. In the New Testament, 
we find also important texts about fasting. Maybe not as many as in the Old Testament, but we find important uh, teaching. Even Jesus fasted for 40 days. Uh, we, we find mention of fasting in the New Testament. The, in the book of Acts, you see the early church fasting um, uh, w while they were ministering together, where they were seeking for guidance, where they were look, looking for uh, ministers, appointing ministers. So it was part of the early church practice. Though after the book of Acts, there is not a single mention about fasting uh, really clearly or any teaching of something. But we know that in the book of Acts, they were fasting and praying. But Jesus tells us um, in Matthew chapter 6, when you fast, so it's not if you fast or something like that, but there is a when you fast, that it will happen, that it is expected that at times Jesus' disciple will fast. Don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. I didn't put all the text here just for context. But your father, you, 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 you do it in secret. You don't do it for sure. You do it before the Lord. And your father who knows what you do in private, your father who sees everything will reward you. So Jesus did not diminish fasting. He talks about fasting. And he is also warning here against hypocritical or sh uh, fasting for show or just looking spiritual pretending that we are spiritual by going into fasting so when the disciple of jesus fast to be seen by god fast really from the heart in the presence of the lord jesus promise and pay attention to that jesus promised that they will be rewarded that's encouraging. There is something that will happen. You have a heart. You are seeking God. You are serious about it. You go to fasting before the Lord in private. You, you humble your heart before the Lord. Promise is coming. There will a reward that will be coming. Spiritual blessing when you fast in a manner that God views as righteous. But at the same time, there is a warning against a way of fasting but as hypocrites do that's the word that jesus do uh, use as hypocrites do so that is important to keep that in our mind uh, another story that uh, uh, about uh, fasting is the we see the pharisee and the and the publican or the tax collector and uh, let me use uh, the term the religious man or the, or the church goer or something because Pharisees kind of looks a bit out of context and we feel disconnected with that so let's use something that is more uh, that we can associate with in that so there's um, a religious man who stood by himself and prayed this prayer I thank you God that I am not a sinner like everyone else okay so yeah, okay, no comment. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, it's like a, I'm not unrighteous, I don't commit adultery, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast, because we're talking about fast here, he's a good guy, he's, he's, he practices a, a lifestyle, he fasts twice a week. And he gives a tenth. And not only he fasts, but he also tithes. So he's, he's, a, he's, he's a good guy. You want to have him in your church. Is that right? <laughs> because he tithes. Okay? The tenth of his income. He's a faithful man. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dare not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And we know the rest, how, how God looks at them and God gives us his opinion. I tell you, this sinner, this tax collector, this one that was despised by the religious man, returned home justified, but not the religious one. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So there's a comparison here of, of value. And the religious man says that he fasts twice per week. So that was not a command. He did it voluntarily. 
His fasting is also listed with tithing as a proof of his righteousness. So is that wrong? That this man fasts twice a week and that he pays his tithe? Is that the message? Is the message of Jesus is don't fast and don't pay your tithe. Otherwise, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Is that the message of Jesus? No, of course it's not, because it should be praised. It's something that is good, and it is according to scriptures to do that. But there's another uh, problem about, about this here. So what about you? Do you pay your tithes? I hope you can say yes. Do you all pay your tithes? Yes. So some people say yes, because you do, but some people don't answer that question. <coughs> do you fast? Sometimes you should, you should. In summary, the religious men provide a negative illustrations because of pride and self-exaltation and comparing and despising others. Not because he fasted or because he paid his, his tax. Uh, his, yeah, his tithes and his tax too. And uh, the kind of fasting that Jesus warns again is he, he is a negative illustration. And the tax collector though it does not mention any fasting, offers a positive illustration of the attitude of a repentant heart of someone who should fast. You, do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it doesn't say that he fast, but as Jesus looked at the hearts of both men, he saw in the heart of the man that didn't fast, the fasting, the true fasting attitude. The, the heart that is pleasing, that is acceptable, the heart of righteousness that God can accept. Amen? So it's about humility. It's about going to God. So where, wherever text you will look in the Old Testament or New Testament, fasting has to come with humility. And fasting in itself will not merit you special favor or grace or anything more. It's not the fasting itself. It's the reason why, it's the attitudes in which, is the desire, is the humility, is the repentance, is the, is the desire to return to God, to make things right. To, do you understand that? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Otherwise, if you don't understand, it's like you don't understand. I said, do you understand? You see nothing. It means you don't understand. <laughs> All right. So the, the problem that you will find many times mentioned, Old Testament, New Testament, is always a problem of heart. Say yes. yes. And at the beginning of this year, as we go through time of fasting and prayer, we should talk about the heart. We never talk enough about the heart. We need to be disturbed. Do you agree with that? If nobody disturbs you with anything, it doesn't make you feel somewhat a little bit uh, discomfort or uncomfortable when you hear the word of God. Nothing's happening. You will never change, you will never grow, you will never be convicted. The kingdom of God cannot take its place into our life. We need to be disturbed. We need, we need to hear the word of God. And sometimes that is not pleasing or not like so uh, exalting or whatever. So forgive me in advance for what I will say, but I need to say certain things this morning that I think will be constructive to all of us, to myself first. One of the main problems God often declares about his people relating to him is the hardness of heart. I will ask you later, do you have a hard heart? You see Jesus greatly displeased and grieved toward the hardness of heart. You will see that in the scriptures. There's a lot of scriptures. I had a long, long list, but because time, I needed to uh, just pick a few. There's a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament about the hardness of heart, how God looks at it, the problems that their hard heart cause in their relationship with God. This is the problem of man. This is your problem, this is my problem. Jesus, looking around at them in anger, grieved by the hardness of their heart. Good thing that Jesus healed this man. 
They were not happy. They were so hard-hearted. The reason given why Israel didn't obey God was hardness of heart. But the house of Israel is unwilling to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. So we see that. In church, we see that and everything. And that's a serious problem because God says here, as we preach the word of God week after week, month after month, years after years, if you come to a spiritual attitude where you will not receive our word, that we believe comes from the word of God to, to bring guidance or exhortations or corrections or feeding. If you come to this attitude of heart where you will not listen, where you are not willing to listen to us, then you are not listening to God. But maybe we, we don't see it, we don't recognize it, but that, that is what happened. This is the Old Testament, this is what God is saying, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah had the same problem, the same kind of conversation with God. When Jeremiah was called, he was told, he will not listen to you. They, they, they all like this. The house of Israel is unwilling to listen to you, to their preacher, because they are not willing to listen to me. If, if you would know that we preach, you know, whatever it is, like, uh, just to make you feel good, and then you would uh, 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 turn your ears, that's, that's maybe a reason. But if you see that we share scriptures from the Word of God, and we pour out our hearts, then we have prayed, and we seek the good and the, 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 the well-being of the spiritual well-being of the church and we are trying to you know uh, plan activities do something share the word of God and you don't never reply you never respond you don't are never willing to change or do something or modify your your habits then there, there's there's a question I'm talking to you from, from the pastoral point of view. There's a question, why? Why we, we are preaching? We're not, you know, crying out loud. We're not offending people. We're not uh, doing something bad. We are calling the church to move together in unity for the kingdom of God. And we plan certain activities and we call people, we exhort people, uh, we try to correct certain things, we try to add activities, but it, it doesn't matter what we say. It just doesn't matter. Nothing changed in your habit. We understand, and I'm saying it with a lot of respect, we understand you have big week. I was talking to someone that I res respect, a father, who has uh, three sons, not from the church here. And he told me one time, he says, if I can make it to church on Sunday, that's already a big mountain that I have climbed. Because talking about the responsibilities, uh, the stress, the tension, I understand that and I respect that. We raise four children. We know it's not easy to have young children go to church and modify our activities. This is perfectly clear for me. You have homework to do. You have all sorts of situations to take care of. You have your, your whole week of work. You have only Saturday to do your grocery and fill the fridge and do some cooking for next week. So we understand all that. But sometime, sometime, when the church is calling to something that should be honored or participated in or that is, should produce something good. There should be sometime a, a willingness to change my, my routine, my, my calendar of activities. Uh, yes, I'm tired, but I'm going to participate because this is part of, of, of being part of the church. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you don't have to listen to me. Close your eyes and close your ears if you want. I, I'm not saying it with a lack of respect. I respect, and I, as I says, I understand. 
But this, here I'm reading this text and it makes me think they are unwilling to listen to you because they are willing to listen, uh, they are unwilling to listen to me. So I'm, I'm just bringing it as a question. <coughs> For the whole house of Israel is hard-headed and hard-hearted. Is that the case? What do we mean by having a hard heart? Reading this week and this fasting and prayer, a very wonderful book, Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards. And here he gives a, a definition of a hard heart. A hard heart is an unaffected heart. It's just not affected by anything. You can say anything. Not easy to be moved. Like a stone, insensible. That's why it is called a stony heart, as opposed to a heart of flesh that has feeling, feeling toward God and feeling for the spiritual things of God. So that's the definition from Jonathan Edwards. And Ezekiel, removing sin out of the heart of man is compared to taking away the heart of stone and replacing it for a heart of flesh. I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will remove the hearts of stone from their bodies and I will give them tender hearts. Oh, there's a difference here. There's two hearts, a hearts of stone and tender hearts. Which one do you have and which one do I have? I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your body and I will give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you. There will be a change. There will be spiritual actions. There will be a transformations, a renewal of the spirit. I will put my spirit within you. I will take the initiative and you will obey. You, you will be transformed. You will be my disciple. You will move in accordance to my guidance and the Holy Spirit leading. So here is my big question to, to, to you, to, to me, to all of us. I, I'm asking myself the same question, do you have a hard heart? I, I'm not accusing you to have a hard heart. That's not my role, I don't want to. Anyway, it, doesn't, it wouldn't produce anything. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. If you are not searching your heart to change, once in a while. If you don't have moments of searching your heart, maybe you have a hard heart. If you are unwilling to change, and you know it, because sometimes we know, there's something in my life that should change, but I'm just not ready to change it. I have a hard heart. Sorry about that. If you are negligent spiritually, and it doesn't really bother you, and we are the church of the Lord, and Jesus is returning soon, then maybe we have a hard heart. If you are disobedient and you know it, and you're just not doing anything about it, then maybe you have a hard heart. Let me go a little bit further, and this is more like a question than a pointing. If you are not generous, and you know you should, what does that make you? If you don't pay your tithe, but you know you should, from the scriptures. You've heard about it, people have exhorted you, you have been reading in it, but you still don't. What would that make you? Actually, let me go a little bit further. In Malachi, I'm not saying that, it says it is robbing God. When a Christian is not reflecting Christ and his conduct or in his attitude or speech, I'm thinking of uh, situations where people say, this, this is how I am. That's their way to say sorry. I'm, I'm hurting you, but my way to say sorry to you is just, I, this is the way I am. I'm not saying sorry, I'm just telling you to accept me just like I am. If we are not involved in the service of God, most likely in the church or in a ministry somewhere, if we are not, and we have no desire to, do we have a hard heart? If we have no interest, it doesn't come to our mind to make disciples. I mean, I'm, I'm getting deep now, because this is the great commission we're talking about. 
And this is the purpose of the church, why the church exists. If you look at the incorporation of Lighthouse Church, why Lighthouse exists, and the original first reason why, Article number one of our Constitution, making disciples, planting churches, doing the work of the Great Commission. So let me ask you, if we have no interest in making disciples and no doubt of it, what does that make us? If we have no doubt about sharing the good news, I'm sorry, I know I'm making all of you very very uncomfortable. If I don't see that, then I should quit my, 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 my role. <laughs> yeah. I'm, as I say, I'm not pointing finger. This is, this is what happened in my search about fasting and prayer and humbling and repenting before God and sorrow and looking at people returning to God and thinking about the church having conversation with people in the church, uh, uh, questioning our purpose, questioning how we respond, how we do things, how we plan our calendar, how we pray. Uh, if, if, if we don't do that, we, we have no leadership, we have no directions, we have no church worthy of being called a church. Is that right? So, the Bible used certain expression in the New Testament. Cloud without rain. Fig tree without fig. Or salt that has lost its saltiness. That might be what would be a correct description of what we have become. Not of what God wants to do, but what we may have uh, slipped away or drifted away or lost our saltiness. We still have the leaves of the fig tree, but there is no fig. No fruit. So hardness of heart, if only for this reason. Hardness of heart is certainly one good reason why we should, as God's people, fast and pray. Just, just for that reason, just for checking it out, just for coming before the Lord and says, Lord, am I one who has a hard heart? Have I hardened my heart? When we discern some hypocrisy in our prayer life and our, in our religion, we should fast and pray. <coughs> Look at what God says here. Listen to me, you stubborn people who are so far from doing right. But that's the, the best part is coming. This is God's attitude. This is what God is ready to do. He says, God, God is there for us. Regardless, even if we have hardened our hearts, even if we have walked away from him, even if we have rebelled, God is still ready for us. I am ready to set things right or to bring my righteousness near. Not in the distant future, not later, but right now. And my salvation will not delay. I'll provide salvation for Zion and bring my glory to Israel. I'm ready to save right now. I'm getting to get to you as soon as you will come to me in hum humility and repentance. I'm ready, not later. Immediately, I will connect with you, and I will touch your heart, and I will change you. Amen? Amen? God is ready to set things right with us, but are we ready to let him do this? That's the point over here. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. You want me to stop? <laughs> I can stop right now, or I can continue a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Reason for fasting. Fasting is a sign of repentance and returning to God. This is a wonderful story. I had so many texts. I had to 
remove a lot, so I kept this one because it touched many aspects. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, if you are really serious about wanting to return to the Lord, get rid of your foreign gods and your images, determined to obey only the Lord, then he will rescue you from the Philistines. So the Israelites got rid of their images and worshiped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, at the great ceremony, drew water from a well and poured it before the Lord. They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. Wow, what a wonderful story of uh, people coming back to God with, with a demonstration of uh, inward and outward uh, repentance. There are many principles here. But it is interesting first to remember that a little bit of the context of this story. The Israelites had been separated from the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of God's presence and victory for 20 years. That is at the beginning of the story. And during that time, all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. 20 years, they, they were longing, they were desperate for the Lord. They, 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 they didn't have the Lord uh, with them, the presence, the victory. Now they were being oppressed. They were in darkness. They were, the enemy were uh, over them. They were being turned into poverty. They lost everything. They lost their, their dignity, their lands, their right. They were being persecuted and all of these things because of that. But the, the, this, is, this is interesting though. It seems to them that the Lord had abandoned them. It's, it's funny because we have a similar feeling. Ask yourself the question, when you feel dry and you feel that God is not responding, you know, because we ask God a lot, we expect a lot of the Lord with good reason, but is it the Lord who has abandoned us, or is that the people who has abandoned God? But it seems that it is the Lord. So the one that seems to be wrong is the Lord, but here it is not the case. So do you feel that the Lord has abandoned you? We cannot be happy a long time without the Lord. And then if you observe some of the requirement in that verse, look at verse 3 more specifically. If you are really serious. The theology of fasting could be summarized right here in that text. Are you serious? If you are really serious. The theology of fasting is a theology of priorities. Where are your priorities? Are you serious with God? That's the whole idea of fasting. It's not fasting. It, who cares about if we eat or not? It's not about that. It's where are your priorities? Why do you fast? Do you fast just to, for yourself? Actually, we see a lot of the Proverbs, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, are correcting the wrong attitude for fasting. The people are shouting to God, God, we are fasting, why are you not responding to us? He says, because you're fasting for yourself. You're fasting with the wrong motives. You're fasting like hypocrites do. So that exists also in the Old Testament. So the theology of fasting is a theology of priorities. Where are your priorities? Where's your heart and the relationship with God? An undivided and inten intensive devotion to the Lord and also concerns for the spiritual life. We are concerned for our spiritual life. Do you have that sort of undivided devotion in your life? Do you have this kind of concern for your spiritual life? Is that something you think about? Is that something you spend time about? Are you really serious about wanting to return to the Lord? The question goes like this. Or if you look at other Bible version, if you return to the Lord with all of your hearts. It's always from the heart. If you return to the Lord with all of your hearts, then get rid of your foreign gods. But I don't have any. I don't, I'm not an idol worshippers. Of course not. You are not. You are not. Get rid 
What do you have in your life that you need to get rid in order to follow Jesus more fully? Is there something, not an idol where you prostrate and pray, we know you don't have that. But is there something that you should clean from your life, that you should get rid in order to follow Jesus more fully? What is it that keeps you from following Jesus more fully? I'm sorry I'm heavy this morning. Things that get too much of your attention. Things that are offensive to God and you are still holding on to. Things that turn your attention away. That keeps you, that captivates your affections and your desire away so that you cannot follow Jesus more fully. Are there things like that? The text says, get rid of these things. Then it says, determine to obey only the Lord. Other Bible versions, prepare your heart for the Lord or give your heart to the Lord. Again, it's the heart determined to obey the, only the Lord or prepare your hearts for the Lord. Again, it goes back to the theology of priorities. Samuel was calling the nation to repentance. And the repentance had to be inward first, with all of your hearts. And then it had to be outward, get rid of all the things you need to get rid of. The heart first and the outward next. So the Israelites got rid of their images and they worshipped only the Lord. So they did it. Are you willing to do it? They, they did it. They obeyed. They, they wanted to. The inward was more important than the outward. It had to come first. Return. No one can real, really see the heart of another. You cannot see the heart of someone. If someone is under the conviction of sin, you don't know. But only the actions will show that this person is really convicted. Someone confess, but without change. It doesn't mean anything. It's the change that shows the reality of the confessions and the repentance. So Israel were in a trap. And our heart is so deceitful. We may not feel. And that is very serious uh, attitude of all of us. This is a, a warning and a trap for all of us. We may not feel that we have slipped away from the Lord because there is still a lot of religion in our, in, in our actions, in our weekdays, in, in our daily life. We may read our devotion uh, without any result. We may go to the church and uh, give uh, some money to the offering and sing the song without any heart uh, really uh, determined to serve the Lord only like we said before. So it is easy to deceive ourselves like that. So they gathered at Mizpah in a great ceremony and they drew water from the well and poured it out before the Lord. Then they went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. So they gathered at Mizpah, which means they showed a spiritual interest. The prophet says, you go there, I will pray for you. They went there. They wanted, they were ready. They have come to the time. Today is the day of my salvation. Today is the day where I, I confess. Today I pass to, to action. So they went to Mizpah. They showed the spiritual need that they had. They were ready. They, were, they had been thirsty and longing and they were there. Then they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord. This is a ceremonial uh, uh, actions, pouring out the water, which is pouring out their heart, an act of surrendering. And then there was a confession. There was fasting, and there was a confession. We have sinned against the Lord. Fasting here came with a demonstration of humility. They humbled themselves. Actually, one of the major expression of the Old Testament about fasting is to afflict one soul, or humble one soul, or deny oneself. So there is this act when it comes to fasting that should accompany a fast. Israel expressed their sincerity by fasting. Nothing else really mattered except getting right with God. Remember about confession, Some, one, one, one idea about confession. Confession is effective. 
not by the confession itself. Confession can only be effective because Jesus Christ died for our sin. That's, that's the, old, the old thing. Confession, oh, I'm doing something. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about uh, crocodile's tears. I, people can see I, I regret, but not really uh, changing. So it's not the confession itself. It's the confessing and the realization that Jesus Christ is the one who paid for my sin. We are forgiven because his blood is cleansing us. And also, confessions is also has to be personal. Okay, you have had this experience in your life before. People came to say, I'm sorry to you, or to uh, apologize of, of something, and it says, if, if I made a mistake, I'm sorry, okay? What does that mean if I made a mistake? It means that I haven't made anything. I'm not, I'm not serious about my, my confession. So it has to be personal, it has to be honest. And here, this says, we have sinned against the Lord. They didn't say, oh Lord, if we have done something to offend you in the past, they really confessed to the Lord. And Samuel prayed for the nations, and uh, this is a wonderful uh, conclusion to that. Amen. I'm skipping a bit on that. In verse 10, a wonderful uh, result of that moment of repentance, of fasting and everything with the right heart, just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke. Listen to that. This is a wonderful uh, action of the Lord. The Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusions that the Israelites defeated them. The Lord answered their heart immediately. And how did he do it? It's, it's extraordinary. Through a miraculous sign of nature, something that is... Uh, that breaks the laws of nature, or something like that. I heard a missionary from my place, and uh, probably in the 40s, in the province of Quebec. They went up north uh, to evangelize, and they live in two uh, very miserable conditions. In those times, everybody were Catholic, and anybody who were not Catholic were, were called communist. And uh, when they were going with their bicycle to, to go in the countryside to visit the, the neighbors, people would go out on, on the, 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 the doorstep and would say, get away, communists, get away, communists. So, so that's how people perceive. And the priest of the place uh, ordered that they would be uh, beaten, they would be attacked. And one day, the, the, they were praying, and the Holy Spirit warned them, they left the house, they hid in the little forest near the house. It was a sunny day. Four guys came, and as they stepped on the doorstep of the house, there was a big, extraordinary thunder that came in a sunny day. And they were so afraid that they went back into the car and ran away. That is a story that has been told to me by, by this missionary that I know. Actually, he's a man that is very, he's, he's not, the one to, to tell a story that it would not be true. He's, he's the pastor that really trained me and gave me my foundation and uh, uh, helped me to get into the ministry. He's a man that I respect dearly. And <laughs> reminds me of this, uh, this story here. This is the kind of victory that Israel was hoping for. Is there a kind of victory that we, as a church, are hoping for? That you, as a parent, are hoping for? <coughs> that you as an individual Christian and your relationship with the Lord, you are hoping for, hoping for something, hoping for a change, hoping for the love of God to, to be revealed, hoping to be restored in your relationship, hoping to, to hear the Lord, hoping to, to walk stronger and better. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, conclusion, fasting with true humility, opens our heart to God and to uh, everything that God wants to do. Food and drink uh, regard our life in the flesh. So when we say, I don't want food and drink, 
it's because I want something more. I want something more of the spiritual. So that is a, a sign that I'm special, uh, that I'm searching in a special way, and I'm serious in my petition before the Lord. Fasting engaged the self more completely into the action of prayer. I'm praying, you're praying, but when I come to prayer with fasting that I determine, I'm showing that I'm engaging my, the self uh, the, the, the will. Fasting leads to an intensification of prayer also. It, it, it does something to, to our uh, approaching our prayer. In addition, the one praying, when you pray with fasting, there's a hope also, because Jesus promised a reward from the Heavenly Father. When you, you, you pray with fasting, you probably hope God, uh, uh, Daniel prayed that also uh, in chapter 9 of da Daniel. He, 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 you read here that uh, uh, I'm serious. I'm serious, God. You see, I'm serious before you. I put away food. I, I really am coming before you. And fasting is useful to experience the presence of God and get results uh, in our lives immediately. God is waiting for us. Amen. So praise the Lord. Let's, let's stand and, and conclude. I, I have so much to say on the subject, but we need to, need to stop. God is 